thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. If, if you can't hear me, just like say something and I'll try to. My husband can never hear me, but I think he just doesn't want to. Um, I know I'm a little bit soft spoken. I tried to do this talk last year. Well, I kind of did it and um, we were we were locked out of the building. It was in the summer and we stayed, stayed outside. It was nice out. I didn't have a PowerPoint, but it didn't start raining. And I was like, well, but despite that, a good time was had, but this time, you can see my slides, and also I've added, I keep adding to this talk, so uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. I, this talk is about drones, the sort of underappreciated um, bees in the hive. So I'm going to, to go through all things about drones, and I hope that by the end of this talk you will um, you'll appreciate them as much as I do. This is just some basics. Of course, I'm sure everybody here knows, and in a typical booming colony in the Spring, you're going to have one queen, maybe 60,000 workers in a strong colony, and maybe 6,000 drones. So there's not as many drones at any given time ever as workers. And in a lineup, the queen is the tallest, but the drone is, um, he's the heaviest, and he's just sort of stout and stocky. And of course, the workers look so adorable next to the other two larger bees, um, being all tiny and petite. And in a, I, this is a, yeah. This is a drone with his two sisters, and notice how his eyes are enormous, and they look like they almost touch in the middle, and he's got a blunt-tipped abdomen, where his sisters have pointy abdomens. And because drones only live to be 22 to 32 days old, I do think that they always look like this. I think they're always young and hot and virile looking. <laughs> yeah. So before I talk about specific about drones, I want to back up to some basic colony survival. And we all know that in order for a single colony to survive, they need a queen, they need workers, and they need food. This is just for, for one colony to survive. It's sort of like for an individual human, you need food, shelter, and water. But what about the colony as a, as a soup organ for the species and a, for the soup organisms to survive? You have to have drones because they are that piece um, to make, just like for the human civilization to go on, we have to reproduce as well. So for colony reproduction, the drones are integral. I'm just going to read this definition of the superorganism right off the slide. The term superorganism is used most often to describe a social unit of eusocial animals where division of labor is highly specialized and where individuals are not able to survive by themselves for an extended period of time. The concept of a superorganism raises the question of what it is to be considered an individual. In terms of selection, the superorganism is the colony, not the individual bees. So in the superorganism theory, the, we can liken all the parts of a colony to, uh, to a parts of a mammal. So the, the, uh, the ovaries is the queen. The brain of the colony is the collective decision-making power of the workers. The liver is the comb because it, it holds on to toxins and processes things. And in that theory, the, the drones are the flying testes of the superorganism. And I could have drawn that differently, and I didn't, and you're welcome. <laughs> So we all talk about how important it is for our colonies to be queen right, but they also have a drive to be drone right, and it's important for them to be drone right. Even though people say, oh, drones are a drain on the colony because they don't do the work that the workers do, they're just a drain on resources, and a lot of times old beekeepers will say, oh, you know, I just I cut the drone brood out, I don't want those drones because they're freeloaders. Well, it's, it's bred into bees to have this drive to raise them, and they are going to be, I mean, I think the a word might be happier that you know colonies are just more settled if they can raise their drones and what, what I want you to keep in mind is that because they aren't you know bees always look after the good of the entire colony before the individual and if they can't afford to raise drones because they are drained on their resources if they can't afford it they're not going to do it so they're going to stop raising drones like if there's if, if something happens if the nectar dries up or doesn't rain for a few weeks and, and the resources get scarce they will they'll get rid of the drones and they'll refuse their entry so when they can have drones, it's like they're prosperous. So I like to think of it as like the bees having trophy husbands. Like we are doing so well that we can raise all these drones. You know, like they're out on the flowers maybe bragging about how well they're doing. And there are studies that show that, there was a study done by Delia Allen in the 60s that showed she had a lot of colonies, like 30 or 60, that she gave free unrestricted drone production, and then she had the equal amount where she restricted, and they were not, didn't have any room to raise drones. And by the end of the season, the drone right colonies made more honey, 
and actually had a little bit more bees in those colonies, which was really interesting. And because bee research is the way it is, there was also a study done by Tom Seeley's lab that proved the opposite, that the drone right colonies actually didn't make as much honey. But things are never black and white in beekeeping. We all know that, right? So with drones, I'm going to start from the beginning. They are bigger bees and they need a bigger crib. So they are raised in larger cells. And what happens when a queen lays an egg, she first puts her head in the cell. I'm sure you've all seen this. It's fun to watch. She puts her head in the cell and she feels with her front legs to see how big that cell is. And if it's small, if it's you know, four and a half to five and a half millimeters, she's going to turn around uh, and then insert her abdomen. And an egg is going to come out of her oviduct and go down over this funny little thing called the valve fold. And at that point, about 25 to 30, 20 to 35 sperm are going to come out of the spermatheca and fertilize that egg. One will be lucky and fertilize the egg. So then she deposits the fertilized egg out her sting chamber into a cell. And the spermatheca is an amazing organ because she goes on these mating flights all within a period of a couple days and she stores all the sperm she needs for, for her entire life. And the spermatheca keeps it fresh, which I think is fascinating. So you have a fertilized egg and those fertilized eggs become females. So they can be workers or if they're fed royal jelly, they can become queens. Now, if she feels that the cell is larger, if it's about six millimeters or seven larger, what happens is as the egg comes down over this valve fold, no sperm is released. So she lays an unfertilized egg and those become the male bees. And the reason why we know that it's the, that mechanism of feeling is because they cut the front legs off queens willy-nilly and discovered that if when they did, I'm sorry, they cut the front legs off queens and discovered that she would just lay willy-nilly a, a fertilized and unfertilized egg and it had nothing to do with the size of the cell. So that's how we know that's the mechanism. And the queens probably didn't like that. <laughs> Honeybees are what we call haplodiploid where the, uh, if you have one set of chromosomes, the unfertilized eggs have, have one set of chromosomes and those become drones or males. And the fertilized, chromos the fertilized eggs will have 32 chromosomes and they will become females. And it's, in humans, we have um, a sex chromosomes, right? We have the X and the Y and how they come together determines the sex. And then honeybees, it's a little, it's a little bit different. What we have are, instead of a specific sex chromosome, is a sex determiner gene at a sex determiner locus. And at this locus, there are alleles. And honeybees have probably up to 145 different sex alleles. So the queen, when she, uh, her she, queen has a mother and a father because she has two sets, so she's gonna have two different alleles. And then when she lays an egg, it's going to have, um, so if she, if she lays an egg that's not fertilized, it's gonna be hemizygous and it'll only have one allele. If she has two different alleles, so if she uses sperm from a drone that has the allele C and she has a little A, that's gonna become a heterozygous female. But if she lays an egg and the sperm has the same allele, so if they both have A, what you get is called a homozygous individual and these are known as diploid drones. Have y'all heard of that? So diploid drones, actually, you, you never see them because they are smaller, they're infertile. So honeybees have evolved to know, hey, these, these guys are not paying off. They're not fertile. So they can actually, the workers can smell when so, that's happening as soon as they clode into a larvae. And diploid drones are usually a sign of inbreeding, and that's a bad thing. It was bad on Game of Thrones, and it's bad for bees. And what you see as a beekeeper is what we call a shotgun brood pattern. You may be familiar with how you see the shotgun brood pattern, you know your queen is not good. That probably means she's either mated with some of her brothers or she's just poorly mated and got unlucky and happened to mate with a drone that has one of her same two sex alleles. And the reason why you see the shotgun brood pattern is, is because as soon as that egg turns into a larvae, the workers can smell it and they, they go around and they eat the larvae. Nothing is wasted, it's protein. Cannibalize it? They cannibalize it, yes, they do. When I do talks to children's groups, I like to say that honeybees are gentle vegetarians and wasps are, you know, mean carnivores. And the truth is that honeybees are gentle vegetarians except when they're cannibals. <laughs> Drones are interesting because they just have that one set of chromosomes. Because of that, you will see some, some recessive genes expressed. And the dominant eye color gene in honeybees is black. Most of the honeybees you see, you know, have black eyes. But in drones, sometimes you'll see these different color eyes. And at the top left, you see these um, beige, and then 
uh, tan and cherry red eye drones. And these are white eye drones. And what's interesting about these uh, drones is that they were used, they came from bees in a colony in Georgia, and they were used to do some research at Purdue. And until, until Brock Harper did this research at Purdue, what it was believed is that white-eyed drones are blind. Have any of y'all heard that before? That they can't see and they're no good and that they're, sometimes you'll hear that it's a sign of inbreeding, but it has nothing to do with inbreeding. It's just a recessive gene. So Dr. Harper was doing all this genetic work. He had spoken at Young Harris and he had said, you know, if anybody ever sees a white-eyed drone layer, let me know. So Bobby Tenpen's club, I think it's Edward River Valley, he posted something about it and I was like, you need to send that queen to Purdue. So he sent the queen to Purdue and she raised lots and lots of drones and they studied them. And what they found was that the white-eyed drones actually don't become blind. It was really interesting. But what they previously believed was based on some work done with flies where there's a, a chemical in their eyes called rhodopsin. And when that's missing, the, the, the calcium that's created through vision gets, doesn't get absorbed. The, like the rhodopsin takes it away and that's what makes flies blind. But in the, um, in the drones, they didn't become blind. So the way they tested it was they exposed them to all kinds of intense light for like lo much longer than they would normally live, just this constant light. And then they put them in a room that was dark and they put the dark eyed drones and these white eyed drones in a room and turn the lights on. And when you turn the lights on, you know what happens, the bees start flying. Well, they started flying. They could see the light for sure. But they did another study where they took the drones not very far away, both black and black eyed and white eyed drones, and they took them, you know, I don't know, 100 meters away, not very far, something that they could typically navigate very well. And not a single one of the white eyed drones made it back. So there's something missing, there's something askew, but they don't know what that mechanism is. So they probably, he said they probably don't mate. They definitely, they might go on orientation flights, but they don't come back. Or they might try to go on a mating flight, but they don't come back. But all that was done because of some cool Georgia beekeepers that sent some stuff in and got it tested, which is very exciting. So boy bees are kind of like boy humans. They need to eat a lot. They're bigger bees and a bigger cell, and they need to be fed a lot. The difference in their diet isn't that different from workers. So all three of the types of bees are fed three different jellies. The queen jelly is a little bit different than the worker jelly and the drone jelly. The biggest difference in drones is because they're bigger bees, they need more food. And similar to the way workers are fed, in the last couple of days of their larval period, they get more brood food, more, I'm, I'm sorry, more pollen and honey and less brood food. <coughs> And you're all probably all familiar with this type of chart which shows that everybody's an egg for three days and then the larval period for drones is a little bit longer, it's a day or two longer and then the pupil period is, is significantly longer. So it takes 24 days for a drone to, be, to emerge, 21 for a worker and 16 for a queen. But what's interesting is these days are not set in stone. They're, they can vary actually kind of a lot from it could take 20 to 28 days for a drone and 16 to 24 for a worker. And the factors that influence how long their pupation times are, are temperature and food. So if they don't, if it's cold, it'll take longer to make bees, or if they're poorly fed, it'll, it'll, take, um, it'll take a longer time. And the survival rates for workers is about 86% of the eggs make it to adulthood, and for drones, it's only 55%. And that probably has something to do with their placement in the nest. So if you take a frame and don't have foundation in it and put it in a hive and let the bees make their own comb, they're amazing little architects. And what they do is they build smaller cells in the middle and that's where they raise their workers. And then around that, they, the cells get bigger and bigger so they raise their drones sort of around the workers. And then they, you know, of course, store their pollen and honey up in the corners. So if you think about those two factors for survival, temperature and food, it's not surprising that drone survival rates are a little bit lower because if there's a cold snap, who's gonna bear the brunt of it? The drones are. Or, you know, if, like if you're sitting in the middle of a restaurant, chances are you're gonna get your iced tea filled faster than if you're sitting back in the corner. And what's kind of cool about this is even in their infancy, the drones are serving their more important worker sisters by providing this insulation, which I think is pretty cool. If you use foundation, what you'll see, and especially in the springtime, is that they're so desperate to have these big cells to raise drones that they will build it anywhere they can, and so they'll make this mess in between the frames. And there are studies that even though the drone brood, they can make it, make raise drones on worker size foundation, they're going to be a little, it pokes out more, but they will be a little bit smaller. And there are, is some evidence that larger drones have 
more sperm and that they are better flying. So you want to have bigger drones. Bigger, bigger is better in the drone world. And this is a photo of a frame that's foundationless and you can see the smaller flat cappings of the workers. And drone brood looks sort of like bubble, bubble wrap. And you can see how they laid it out in here with the more important worker brood in the middle. I mentioned earlier about how they um, they will cannibalize larvae that is disease that's bad, like the diploid drones. But at any time, like if if as I mentioned, if resources get start to dry up and they aren't as plentiful, and they decide they can't afford to raise these drones, they'll do this behavior called brood trimming, where they're cannibalized eggs, larvae, and even capped pupae as changes in temperature and resources dictate. And this is what's interesting about the, this behavior of the bees is that how does one worker know what her sister's doing? You know, how do they know what's going on in the colony? Which ones do they need to call? But somehow they do. Somehow they magically know. And it's just fascinating to think about these feedback mechanisms that must be in there that we have no understanding of. But what I want to impress upon you all is that the bees can figure out if they don't need the drones. And I want to encourage, I like to encourage people to give people, give the bees the capacity to raise drones, knowing that they can monitor what's a healthy amount of drones for them to be raising. So when does drone rearing happen? It, the largest amount of drones are raised in the spring, and they start early because they want to be, be active in time to be sexually mature enough to mate with queens during the swarm season. So they, the drones come out first, and then the queen cells uh, will come out later, the swarm cells. They will also raise drones during a nectar flow, so even later in the summer, you know, all through the fall, they will raise smaller and smaller amounts. If you ever give your bees some drone size foundation, what I notice is in the spring, it'll be full, full drone brood both sides. But what they start to do is use those larger cells for honey storage as the, season, as the summer goes on. But they'll keep raising small amounts of drones, even in through September sometimes. So this is what a drone, drone schedule looks like when he emerges. First, they, they don't have a birthday, they have an emerge day. On day one, their cuticles hardening and they can't fly. They're all fuzzy and cute. The, for the first week, they're pre fed primarily by nurse bees. And at this time, you're gonna see the younger drones, they stay on the brood combs. So those drones that you see on the brood combs, you know are the younger ones. As they get older, after about a week, they just move on up to the honey supers until it's time for them to fly because they just need to eat honey from that point on. The protein and the, what they do is the workers will kind of like bump them and then feed them the regurgitated contents of their stomach, the nurse bees, which has a lot of pollen in it, and they need that protein in order to become sexually mature. So for the first 12 days, their reproductive organs are maturing. They come into the world with everything they need. There's, the sperm is in their testes, but it has to migrate to the seminal vesicles, and it has to mature, and they need that protein for that to happen. And then between day six and nine, they'll go on their first orientation and cleansing flights. And starting on day 12, their mating flights can begin. That's when they are at earliest sexually mature. So I'm gonna talk about their one job because drones don't do any significant work in the colony. They do one little thing that I'll talk about later. But for the most part, their only job is to go out and mate with queens from other colonies. So I'm gonna first talk about how they're different from workers and then how they are equipped for their one job, how they're specially equipped. So compared to workers, drones are lacking in a few ways. They have tiny mandibles. They don't need to be able to chew propolis and uh, carry things around the way workers do. And they have a short proboscis. They don't need to be mining nectar out of flowers. The, the bee movie was wrong. Dr drones don't collect nectar. So they just that their proboscis is about three millimeters where workers is about six. They don't have pollen collecting structures on their legs. They have a slender crop because again, they're not collecting nectar so they don't need that multi-chambered stomach. And they don't have wax, hypopharyngeal, or nasonoff glands. And what makes them fun to work with is they don't have a sting gland, so they can't sting you. And that's, so when you're, um, if you're a newish beekeeper and your friends come over and they're seeing you in the hive, you can take a couple drones and put them up in your veil. And uh, when they're like, oh, there's a bee on your face, you'd be like, oh, no big deal. You know, I'm one with my bees. <laughs> I've seen Virginia Webb do that a few times. <laughs> then compared to workers, they also have some things that help them do their job. Their antennae have 10 times the olfactory plates of workers. 10 times. You think about, we all know how great workers can smell, right? They're, they can hover above 
a garden and be able to smell nectar that their sister gave them a sniff of a few minutes before. So they have to be able to smell the queen's pheromones while they're flying looking to mate. So they have an incredible sense of smell. They have an extra segment on their antennae. They have much larger compound eyes because they have to be able to spot these queens while they're flying and the optic lobes of their brain are bigger in order to process that information. Their mandibles, although they're tiny, they produce pheromones. So these pheromones probably help the, the drones orient when they're out flying and also might help the queens smell them. We don't really know, but that might be the case. They have larger flight muscles and they have broader wings because their job is done while they're on the wing, while they're flying. And this is the one thing that they do do in the nest. Their thorax creates heat for the brood. So they will, when they're down there, especially those first few days when they're, uh, drink, they're being fed by the nurse bees, they will be sort of cued to vibrate their thorax and generate heat to keep the brood warm. They can generate more heat than the workers. So they, it's, it's kind of like that one kid who occasionally makes his bed. He's pretty spoiled for the most part, but they do pitch in a little bit around the house. So that's good to know. Now on this slide, this is a picture of bees mating. And there's nothing on it because it is literally impossible to see from the air. There's two little bees and they're flying, you know, 100 feet up or however high it is. It's literally impossible to see. And because you cannot force bees to mate in the lab, you could put a virgin queen next to a drone in a cage or on a table and they will have nothing to do with each other. And those same two bees, 12 feet in the air, will all of a sudden become interested in each other. And because it was so hard to study for a long time, like ancient times, people thought that and because the the drone's reproductive organs are all internal. When you look at them, they thought maybe bees just didn't mate. They just sort of, you know, had this sort of chaste reproduction. But when researchers were able to attach kites to queens and film it with film, they could really understand what was happening. So that took a while. And what happens is drones and queens go to these special areas called drone congregation areas. And the drones leave the nest in the afternoons between 1 and 4 or 3 and 7, depending on which book they read. And they fly in these areas about 30 to 200 meters in diameter. And they're, so you've, you will have hundreds, if not thousands, of drones flying in one area. And they've got that mandibular pheromone, so it's probably saturating the area that lets other drones know, oh, you've made it, and also lets queens know, here it is, sort of like smelling beer and peanuts in a bar. And then they, what they'll do is they have about 30 minutes of gas in their tank. They fill up their stomach, and they have about 30 minutes to fly. So they'll spend maybe five or 10 minutes getting to the DCA. 10 or 15 minutes flying around, and then they have to fly home if they don't mate. The interesting thing about the times, in most of the books it says 12 to 3 or 1 to 4, but in the warmer the climate is, the later they fly. So in Atlanta, where I am, they don't really, you don't see bees in DCAs until at least 3 o'clock. And I've seen them in there as late as 7 and uh, even later in the middle of the summer. So the time of day is really key to figuring out where, where your DCAs are. There was a woman who did her research at University of Florida, and she was she was using some testing some traps to find DCAs, and she almost quit because she didn't know that they were flying so late. And in Florida, they fly even later because it's even warmer. So that's kind of an interesting thing to know. The coolest thing about DCAs is that they are mysterious because the drone congregation areas remain the same year after year. So the same spots are where the bees will go, but nobody really understands why. Drones, they don't communicate with each other, they don't do dances, they don't do orientations and things like that. And there's no intergenerational learning because the drones for the most part die out in the winter. They, you know, they only live 22 to 32 days. So how do they know where to go? And nobody really knows. It's kind of mysterious. There are a few clues that humans have figured out over the years. One is that they tend to go for depressions in landscape. So when they leave the nest, they're more likely to fly downhill than uphill. There are visual cues that they will fly along like tree lines or they might follow a river. So they sort of follow visual cues to head out. We don't know why they will stop and then fly up to a DCA. We don't know where that is. You often read that a perfect DCA is an open area surrounded by a windbreak. So a field lined by trees or a parking lot with tall buildings. And there's another theory by um, Gerald Loper that's really interesting and he really believes that DCAs are where there are magnetic anomalies in the land, in the earth. We know that all bees have iron particles in their abdomens, so 
Queens workers and drones, and if, if, they have, if they're forced to only use it, workers will use magnetic fields to orient. So this is definitely a possibility. The paths that drones and queens use to get to and from DCAs they call flyways. And on the right, there's a really cool map done by Gerald Loper where they did a study in Arizona where the, the, uh, the flora is much lower than it is here. It's not a lot of hardwood trees. It's mostly shrubby stuff. So they were able to use radar in the spring when the, the drone population is booming and see where the drones are going. So these dots are the DCAs and the lines are the flyways. And they fly along flyways a little bit lower elevation and when they get to the DCAs then they circle up and they go higher. And you can kind of see where they're following some, some landmarks in the land here, which is pretty cool to see. These are some videos, I hope you can, yeah you should be able to see it pretty well on the screens, of um, this is a, I was using a helium balloon and a trap and the, to trap drones and the trap has some queen pheromone in it and if there's queen pheromone in the air what the bees do is they will, any, anything that moves, they will chase it. So if they smell a queen, they line up in what we call comets. So they line up together and they will follow the queen. And then the first drone to, to make, get to her will be the first to mate with her. So you can kind of see the bees, all the little specks, especially like right there. You see them lining up at where, and there's one right here, one right here. So I'll play that one again. See them right there, going around up there. And you can, you can probably tell how many bees are in the air just by looking at that. And here's another one. See that one right there? Did y'all see that? Isn't that cool? And then this one. There's a pretty big one. Yeah, did you see it? Pretty cool. So. Honeybees have evolved a really interesting behavior to cut back on inbreeding. I was talking about earlier, it's not good if she mates with her brothers. And what happens is drones like to stick to DCAs that are closer to home. So I used, on this map, I used to have this, or on this graphic, I used to say this was a third of a mile and that the queens were a mile away, but it really has everything to do with the density of the colonies in the area because they will stick even closer or they'll go farther away. But the drones stay close to home. Chances are most drones are not going to get to mate. And it makes sense that since they have to go home, they can only have 30 minutes of flying time, so they're going to stick close to home, and so they'll go out and they'll fly around, look for queens, and you saw how many drones were in that DCA, right? So most of them are not going to get to the mate. So they go home, they'll suck up more honey, and then they'll head to a different DCA, and they'll go to several in an afternoon, and from one colony, the drones will be going to different DCAs at all times. So the queens come out and they fly about 26 feet off the ground, about 8 meters, but when the drones leave the nest, they go up to about 26 meters, 85 feet, which is about hardwood tree height, and they head out. So they're flying at different altitudes, and then the queens, when she gets to a DCA, there's going to be plenty of guys for her to choose from, so she can sort of afford to fly farther away, because each, each mating takes two seconds, so she can get all of her mating done and make it back. So it's really cool that they have evolved this, this behavior to, um, to cut down on inbreeding. They will mate in the flyways if they come across each other. They will, they'll, and they'll mate in the, in the bee yard if they come across each other. So now I'm going to talk about bee sex, how it happens. So you've got all these bees flying around. The, the drones can smell the queen from 60 meters away. They can smell her mandibular pheromone, which is a sex attractant. And interestingly, virgin queens have less mandibular pheromone than mated queens, which is kind of something you wouldn't think of. So the queen, the drone, the, they form these comets that y'all saw in the video, and they'll come up to the queen, and the first one to make it to her is going to be the first to mate. So he's going to uh, he's going to grab her with his front four legs, and then she will open her sting chamber if she, she can refuse, but she, if she opens her sting chamber, he can mate. And then his endophallus, which is his complicated sex organ, everts into her sting chamber. And this action paralyzes him. He snaps backwards and it paralyzes him. And then he dies. He falls to the ground and dies. And this whole thing takes a second or two. And it's an audible popping noise is made that you can sometimes hear from the ground. And this is a photograph of his very complicated endophallus, we call it. And look how big that is. And see how big his abdomen is. I mean, it makes sense that when this ruptures, you know, that this most of what's in there, that, that it kills him. So you will never see, drones never go back. 
And sometimes people have sent me photos of of drones that are blown out like this on their landing board and say, well, these drones made it back. Well, they probably didn't. Other things can make them um, can make them do that. When the queen comes back to the nest, she's going to have the what the tip of the endophallus of the previous, the last drone she mated with in her sting chamber. A healthy queen, a, a, you know, well a well mated queen is going to mate with. The books say 12 to 20, but Dave Tarpey's lab now dissects queens. You can mail them in and they dissect them and they analyze how many different drones the queen's mated with. And he's got some that mate with 50 to up to 85 different drones. And so the, it's probably a lot more than 12 to 20. And again, it just takes a second and there are all those drones there. What's interesting about this is that the mating sign has a little bit of orange on it. And people used to say, well, that might help the drones see, oh, this is where it happens. But if you look at the, this, his anatomy, see these little horn things? They're called corona or pneumophyces, and, they're, and, and mature drones, they're coated with this orange stuff. So when you see this orange stuff, what that means is there was another drone that tried to mate with her, and he, he, couldn't, he didn't make it. So he, but he got the orange stuff rubbed off onto the mating sign from the previous drone. And a queen will go, she could go on multiple mating flights, she could get it all done at once, but maybe the weather gets bad, or She's got a mating sign that can't be pulled out, so she goes back and she might go out again on the next day or the next day. But usually it's all done within a, a very short few days. And about 70% of the time she comes back with the mating sign still there. And the mating sign's kind of interesting. You'll hear people say, oh, the drone's penis snaps off like it's this violent thing, or the queen breaks it off, but it's not like that at all. It's more like the space shuttle separation. So this is a, a, a diagram of the endophallus and this is the mating sign just this end piece right here and people often ask how does the mating sign get pulled out Will the drones pull it out well how does that happen I mean they're flying 15 miles an hour you know he's just trying to grab on and get in there so what probably happens is kind of interesting so the endophallus everts and I'd like to think of it like when you thank you COVID we all know what these blue gloves are do so when you take off gloves like that, the fingers stay inside, and then you blow it and it pops out. That's kind of how the endophallus comes out. So it doesn't just come out, it everts inside out. So the first thing that's going to come out is the, what you see at the base. And there are these ha stiff hairs that point downward. So those stiff hairs pull out the mating sign from the previous um, drone that she mated with, which is kind of interesting. And then she gets back to the nest, and how does she get rid of it? She actually scoots her bottom across the comb, and that's how she gets rid of her previous mating sign. And the, the workers clean her up. Now you all, if you've been beekeeping for a while, you've probably heard that the drones get kicked out of the nest in the fall, right? And that they get murdered. It sounds like some real Game of Thronesian thing. But it's actually not quite that violent. Winter drone expelling happens much more gradually. It's not a big fight. There are typically only 10 to 15 drones expelled in one day, and it can take weeks to get rid of all of them in the fall months. There are specialized workers, and they chew and maul the drones, but they don't sting them. And the workers that attack and expel drones are older, and they might be unemployed foragers. That's a time when things are slowing down with more time on their hands. And the older drones get expelled before the younger drones. So they somehow know, you've been around a while, you got to go. A couple summers ago, I did a um, little research for my Master Crafts project where I raised drone brood in an incubator. I did this down at Georgia Tech. They let me use some of their equipment, which is really nice. And this, so I was pulling out drone brood from my colonies all summer and putting it in this incubator. They shared the incubator with these Madagascar hissing cockroaches, which was kind of funny. They don't smell very good. And then every day I would go down and as the drones emerged, I would glue these little RFID chips on their backs. So the idea was to see at what age they start leaving the nest and how long they're gone. So this is a little video of gluing on the little chips. You just use super glue. And then these are a bunch of fellows with the, t the tags on their backs. And there were two colonies up on the rooftop of a building, and there weren't any other colonies out there, so the, they only they were sort of forced to go in these two colonies. And each one was equipped with this special equipment. This they were every bee had to come and go through this little tunnel, and they kind of hated that. But it's got two sensors in it that they call antenna. So if the first one is tripped, and then the so if number two is tripped, then number one 
we know that the drone was leaving and if one trip was trip first and then number two, you know they were coming in. And this was just a happy accident that I got this photo with the drone flying in with a little tag on his back that you can see. And these are the colonies, each had a cord that went into this box and then there's a USB drive that I would take in and download the data for what the drones had done. This is the, what the reports kind of look like. The US, so each chip has a unique identifier number, so every drone, we knew what every drone was doing, and I knew what, what their birthday was and how old they were. So this is what a typical report, you'd see what they were doing, and then the, what's, what you wanna look at is these last two columns, antenna one and antenna two, like I showed you on the diagram. So you can see these two were tripped here, and we know that they were arriving based on which one was tripped first. And then if only one is tripped and not the other, it says unknown. And you see just antenna one was tripped, it says unknown, and just antenna two was tripped and that says unknown. So I was down there one day in September when they were starting to expel their drones and I found a dead drone on the ground and he had the tag on his back. So I scanned him in and looked at what was happening as the last bit of his life. So this was at 12.23. And he's tripping the number two antenna. He's tripped it, tripped it. And when you see like 25 unknown, that means he tripped it 25 times. So this whole time in this little teeny one inch segment, he's struggling with his sisters. And then finally, six minutes later, it took, it took them six minutes to kick him out. I think he put up a good fight. But I just thought that was kind of interesting. It takes a lot of time. So it's not like they can just murder them all one day and drag them out. And I want to encourage y'all to make room for drones. It's, I do think it's important that the colonies get to feel drone right. There's a couple of easy ways to do that. Beekeeping suppliers, and Bob carries this, uh, have this green drone comb. And it's a plastic frame, and it's got the, the um, foundation pressed in it that's the right size to raise big, healthy drones. But you don't need special equipment. This is kind of nice because you can spot it real easily in the colony. You can also put a short frame in a, t in a deep box and they are, especially in the spring, they're so desperate to drop drone comb that they will fill the whole thing with large cells. You can also just take a deep frame and pop the foundation out completely and you don't even need to put a starter strip in if you put it between two frames of drawn brood comb, not honey, but, drood crumb, but brood comb. They'll draw it out immediately and they'll be big, nice um, drone size cells. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. I'm sure some of you know that, drone, that Varroa, our public enemy number one, prefers drone brood. And it's quite interesting how that, well, uh, what we know about this, that which is that Varroa evolved with Apis serrana, the eastern honeybee. And in Apis serrana, they've been together for so many hundreds of years that they've evolved sort of a, a happy medium and they don't kill those colonies. And in Apis serrana, they only reproduce in the drone brood. And we already know that drone brood smells differently. So the varroa can smell it. And they, if there's drone brood there, they're gonna jump in those cells. And that's actually what this green comb is made for. It's made for an IPM practice so that you can cut your mite loads without putting pesticides in called drone brood removal. So what drone brood trapping, I'm sorry and it's really varroa trapping. So you put these combs in, and then they lay the drone brood, and the varroa can smell, oh, it's about time for this to get capped, and they jump in there to reproduce, and at that point, you can take the frames out and put them in the freezer, which will kill the varroa and also kill the drone larvae. You put them back in and just keep going until you, you can cut down on your, on your drone, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, on your mite count. When I was doing this thing, I did it all summer long, and as the summer went on, I was noticing more and more Varroa coming off these bees. And this, isn't this awful? That was actually a drone. He looked like that when I pulled him out, and he was still alive. So I was freaking out. I was thinking, man, my colonies must, the mite counts must be outrageous. So I would go home and do a mite roll, but none of the colonies that I was pulling from as eight highs ever reached the treatment threshold. I think because all the Varroa was jumping into these, um, into these cells. So, I don't want anybody to get to have a varroa factory. What I would encourage you to do is take your capping scratcher and when you have your frame of drone brood, just use it like a little comb and, and pull out a little chunk of drone brood and then look at it and see this is, I can count one, two, three mites in there. So that's kind of a lot. If I pull that out, like I'm, you can also tell that this is later in the season because you can see the shiny nectar in the back of these cells. If it was in spring, it would be solid drone brood. So this was later. So then I, I just fed it to my chicken. So you can sacrifice one or two forkfuls, and if you don't see varroa, put it back in and let the bees raise their drones. 
pesticides are really bad for bees, we already know that, but drones are especially sensitive to it. And neonicotinoid, those systemic pesticides, it makes drone sperm counts 39% lower. And even treatments that you do for mites in the spring, you wanna be careful, carefully time your mite treatments if you're raising queens, because you don't want to have infertile drones when it's time for them to mate. So that's something to think about if you are a queen producer. So now I'm gonna talk about how to find drone congregation areas, because I know you all wanna know where your DCAs are now, right? Um, there are a couple of methods that people used to use. That people, this is some people with, going out with a long pole, and at the top of the pole, there's some queen mandibular pheromone to attract the drones, and you can walk around a field with this. You can also walk around with the helium balloon, and that's what I tried first. So this is actually a weather balloon. It looks small, but it's like five or six feet in diameter, and it's filled with helium. It's quite pricey. He helium is a finite gas, and we, there's a worldwide helium shortage, thanks to all the party cities in the world. Mm -hmm. And so it costs like 100 bucks to fill this thing up. This method really takes two people. That's my buddy Courtney, because one person's sort of uh, taking care of the balloon and make sure it's, it's a long kite string, making sure it's not getting caught in trees, and the other person is looking with binoculars to look for drones. And where we are in this picture is a soccer field near my house. And I went and looked on Google Maps to see where my possible DCA should be. And according to the books, this is textbook, man. It's an open area with a windbreak. It's surrounded by trees. And this was a perfect day. It was calm. It was clear. It was late in the day. It was, and Hans, I didn't know the thing about 3 o'clock, but it was before 3 o'clock. We didn't see a single insect in there. And then we went to a neighbor's backyard that has the same thing. It's, a, it's an open sort of uh, half circle shape with lined by trees. Not a single drone there. And then we went to a parking lot same thing didn't see anything and it was kind of depressing and I, and it took it was time consuming we had to shove the balloon in the back of my car and um, make the hatch kind of shut and I thought well I'll just keep walking around with it because I spent hundred dollars on helium until I find one and the next morning that balloon was dead on the ground and I thought well there's got to be a better way so even though I'm not one of those techie people who can't wait to get a new gadget I ended up buying one of these unmanned one of these mechanical drones which I'll call a UAV for unmanned aerial vehicle so we, we won't be confused by the teddy bear drones over here. So when I say drones, I'm talking about the bees. When I'm talking about the mechanical drone, I'll call it a UAV. So I got one of these UAVs and I learned to fly it. And so I used that to go around with queen pheromone. So there's a thin piece of thread here tied to the, the feet of the, of the UAV. And then it's dangling this, you need something to hold the lure and it's dangling this little thing, this little lure, and it's nice to have something big enough that you can focus your camera on. So that's what I've been using. For lure, there's this great product called Temp Queen, and it's artificial queen mandibular pheromone. It's really hard to get the real stuff. I know that the labs sell it for research, but this stuff works great. It's actually made for when your colony is queenless and you don't want laying workers to develop. So you put it in and it'll suppress the ovaries and the laying workers until you have time to get a, a queen in the mail or whatever. And we were at a GBA meeting a few years ago, and the speaker was talking about how her life in bee beekeeping and how she, she had a slide of herself with the pole somewhere looking for drunk congregation areas, and she said, oh, we use QMP. So a friend of mine's wife was there at the dinner, but she's not a beekeeper, and she didn't know what QMP was, and she had a glass of wine, and she leaned over to my friend and she said, did she say they use human pee? <laughs> so we'll never let, let, let her live it down. We don't use human pee. That will not work. You want to use QMP. To attach your QMP, you want something lightweight that some wind can blow through. And I found that these little hair rollers work great. You just peel off the fuzzy outer layer. And you want to use thin cotton thread to attach it to. At first I thought I wish you use fishing line or something strong, but I got a mentor. There was a guy in my club who was a professional UAV pilot and he was a new beekeeper and so we kind of did a trade and he taught me all the tools of his trick. I think I came out ahead. And he was like, no, you want to use thin cotton thread because if your lure gets caught on a tree or something, it's better to lose a few bucks and a hair roller than to crash your expensive UAV. So that makes sense. So you want the cheapest, thinnest thread that you can find. And then a, a, a friend of mine said, well, she didn't want to buy a bunch of hair rollers, so she just cut, drilled some holes in a pill bottle, and that works great, too. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. You want something that's a little bit weighty just to keep it from blowing around, but not too heavy so that it swings too much. And that when I was first doing this, I was afraid of creating an artificial DCA because the, the propellers have create a wash and they create, create wind, and I didn't want to be flooding the area with QMP 
and making that happen. I've since tried to create a DCA and it doesn't work, so that's not really an issue. But it is nice to have the lure farther away and I'll show you why in a second. But what I did was I just flew my UAV up until I couldn't feel the wash on my face anymore. And for this machine, it was about 20 feet. So I usually try to use at least 20 feet uh, long of string to dangle the lure below. And the first UAV I had was one of these pretty white ones. And it was great because these, see how high the propellers are and the feeder down here? And that one finally broke, broke my heart. And all the newer UAVs are, people want them smaller, they want them compact, and they're really close to the ground. So it's a little bit more challenging because you don't want that thread to get caught in your propellers. Trust me, it's not fun to, to detangle. But the newer UAVs also have some really cool features like a return to home. So if you can't see it, you can push the button and it'll come back. But there are a few things you can do to accommodate for these, this, the low profile of these machines. You can buy these little feet that will give you some added height, which are really inexpensive. And I use this device that's really called a payload drop. It's gear that's supposed to hang things from UAVs. I'll show you a picture. I love this picture, like how realistic is that, right? But you know, you ordered some apples, here they are. They're gonna drop it. I'm sure that works great. But anyway, the, what I do is I attach paracord to the drop mechanism and, and I'm not dropping it. But the paracord is not gonna blow in the wind when the propellers start. If you just have thread, the thread's so light, it's gonna blow. So this kind of keeps it from coming up and getting tangled. So I have about three or four feet of paracord and then I have the thread in my lure. Now where are you gonna look? I have found that the depression in landscapes is, is, has worked for me. So a good place to start, you can get Google Earth Pro. This is not Google Maps, it's Google Earth Pro. It's software you can download. And you go to settings and it has this little um, setting called elevation exaggeration. You bump it up to the maximum, which is three. And it, then, you, then you go, you type in your address and you can move outside, you know, away from your apiary and it'll show like, any little hill, it looks like a cliff, like a drop off. And those are, it's just a place to start. And when you're looking for DCAs, I will warn you that it can feel like looking for a needle in a haystack because I flew my UAV for weeks before I found one and I was about ready to give up. And I'd been talking to Dr. Delpain about it. And he was like, well, keep trying, you know? And I was like, okay. And then I found two in one week. And it was, it's really, it's even sweeter when you don't find one for a while and then you find one because it's very, very cool. Time of day again start later in the day. If you are in a DCA with the UAV, you're gonna know within a minute. So you could fly around maybe for five minutes and then you might stake out a few places, fly around, and then you know go to one, two, and three, and then circle back to the first one again just in case you were too early. If you see tens of drones on your lure, I was pretty excited when this happened. It was like tens of drones. But tens of drones are a flyway. Still good information to have, but that's not a true DCA. A DCA is gonna have hundreds, if not thousands of drones. So this is a, the first DCA that I found. And so if you can see the little white dots down the, near the lure, and this really is the reason to have the longer string because you get a much better picture of the area. You're not just staring right at the lure. You can see the whole area. And I hope this doesn't make you car sick. But also notice what we're flying over. Is this a big open field? No, it's tree canopy. Mm -hmm. And first I was like, do I need to be moving 13 to 17 miles an hour? It has nothing to do with it. They, as long as the pheromones in the air, they're gonna be attracted to that lure. So this particular house is, there's the street. If you keep going down this street, just one or two more lots is that soccer field. I flew over that soccer field for weeks because it should have been the DCA, but it wasn't. It was over here, over trees. And then the house I told you about that I went to next with the bowl in the backyard, the, the yard is not a DCA, but the tree line above the yard is a DCA. I know Atlanta is a city of trees, but what I'm finding is that a lot of DCAs are actually over tree canopy. And some of the stuff you read about the, the windbreak is, you know, it's hard to mate, and if, the, if it's windy, it's harder for them. Well, they will stay on that lure up to 400 feet high. So I don't think that they necessarily have to mate lower. They're gonna go wherever. So that having a windbreak is not necessarily a thing. But most of the research, because they were using poles or balloons, well, it's kind of hard to, to survey an area over trees. So I think that part has been influenced just by the, the research methods that were available. So I'm gonna show you some videos from a couple of other DCAs. And again, if you look down close to the lure, you see the little white specks. 
And they do fly, they are for some reason attracted to the UAV, so I will warn you that a few of them do get chopped up on the propellers. It's not ideal, but it happens. So that was again a, on another very wooded site. This is at Georgia Tech. And you can see in the beginning, see all of those bees around the lure. Especially in the beginning, there was a big old clump of them. And as you've been there a minute, they're like, hey, what's going on upstairs? I think, I don't, at first I thought it was maybe defensive behavior, but I think that someone mentioned to me, well, maybe they're attracted to it. You know, maybe they think it's a, some giant rock and queen up there that's just buzzing really deeply. The video was done during COVID. That's the only reason why I was able to fly there. You, flying a UAV, there's lots of rules you have to follow, and you typically can't fly over an area where there are a lot of people without getting permission, which is sometimes easy and sometimes hard to do. And here's another one. This is in Massachusetts. This was a really cool one. And again, there was an open area adjacent to this, but that's not where they were. They were over these trees. And we had flown in this at one o'clock and maybe saw one or two bees, but by, and this is in Massachusetts, by four o'clock, it was booming. This is my citizen science project. It's a website where I want people to find DCAs and then pin them. You can find them any way you want. Pin them on a map because I think that we don't know that much about DCAs is because there's just very little that are available to study. So if you think it's interesting, I would encourage you to go find a DCA and what you can do on the website, you can read about drones and about how to find them, pretty much the stuff that's in my talk. And then if you click on view the DCA map, you see this Google map and all these red spots are DCAs that people have pinned. Most of the ones in other countries, except for Canada, are researchers that I reached out to when I was doing this. I wrote to anyone who would listen to me and say, what do you think about this? What should I do? What should I avoid? And a lot of them, people who had done drone work, were kind enough to pin the DCAs that they had found. And if you zoom in and roll over any of these pins, the, this little details button pops up and if you click on it you can see the information that the person uploaded. None of it is necessarily re required but um, it's just kind of things I thought that people might want to know. And most of mine I have YouTube videos of the flights which is pretty much what I just showed you a second ago. What I don't address on the website is how to safely pilot a UAV. It's, it's an expensive piece of equipment that can can be dangerous, you know, you can't fly over roadways, you could cause a car accident, so I don't even pretend to, to tell you how to do it. In Georgia, the laws are you know, the laws are different in every state, but in Georgia, you don't have to have a professional drone pilot license to, to do something like this, and it's actually legal to fly over private property so long as your feet are on public property, so you can stand in the street and fly over your neighbor's yard. I was in a on a cul-de-sac just about a mile from my house one afternoon I was flying around hadn't seen anything and I was standing in the cul-de-sac in the road and this pickup truck comes up behind me and there was no hello or anything the guy just goes what are you doing and I could tell he wasn't happy and I was like hey I'm actually doing honeybee research you know who, who knew and I um let me just land my UAV so I landed it and he's like what do you mean honeybee research so I told him a little bit about it and he goes well I know a beekeeper like people will do mm -hmm. and I said yeah who do you know you never know I might know them and he was like, no, you probably don't know her. I know her from kayaking. She lives what, up and coming. And I said, Kelly Campbell. And he was like, oh, yeah, it is Kelly. And then by the end, he ended up asking me to fly back up and take a picture of his house and email it to him, which I did because, you know, we're all be ambassadors. We've got to be nice to people. So I'm just a mile and a half away, and I hadn't seen Kelly in a while. And I get this text from her, and there's a screenshot of her conversation with this guy where, where he had said to her, some bee lady was flying a drone over her house today saying she was looking for male honeybees zooming over my treetops, WTF. She said she knew you, so I figured she had to be cool, so I didn't shoot her. <laughs> so please don't get shot. Just be nice to people, and they typically respond in kind. There was a, an apartment complex near my house that I used to fly over, and there was a swimming pool. Again, I'm thinking about what they might be attracted to, so I flew over the swimming pool, went around, and I got home and I was looking at the footage that I had taken and I noticed that there were some people who were gesturing, letting me know that they were not happy that I was flying over the swimming pool. And I was like, I'm not a pervert, I'm just a bee person. So, so you just want to be careful when you're doing, you know, if you're doing something like this to not offend people because I don't want anybody to get shot. So I have a couple slides of references if there were any papers you wanted to look at, if anybody wants to take a picture. And I've got two of them. And then there's this one. And then I'd be happy to answer any questions that you'll have. 
And maybe I told you everything you ever thought of about drones. What's, you, the, long, what's the latest you found at DCA, like as far as timing in the year? Can you still find them October. Now? Yeah. It's well, not not uh, not now. There was a. I think it was. 2021 we had that crazy hot October remember it was like 97 degrees the first week in October so I found I mean I, I saw drones in DCAs I didn't find them but I kept monitoring the same ones just to see how late it would go but it really is weather dependent it's how it's temperature dependent mm -hmm. and the idea is I, I don't know if I mentioned this when we we're on the map that anybody who wants to can download the data about the DCAs and I know it's pretty simple it's just here's a DCA but Google Maps is always coming out with new things, that the ways to analyze. And I mean, for me, even just seeing how many of them are over tree canopy and how many are in open area is interesting. So I'm hoping that someone smarter than me might be able to take this data and infer something so we can learn more about drones. So that's sort of the purpose of, of that thing. And it is really cool to be in a DCA. You really feel like you're in a magical area. I forgot to mention that there was a DCA in Selborne, England, that is known to have bees in it since 1792. Yeah, there's a naturalist who had written about, he was in this, this area, and he heard this droning of bees, and he didn't know what it was, and there was a BBC, you know how NPR does those little sounds, and the, um, there's a BBC story in 2017 where a guy went, and he took his microphone, and he recorded the, the hum of the drones, and that, that DCA is still active, which is very, very cool, yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it.